This wall behind me is made out of dustcrete. This is a process that I invented, a derivative of the hempcrete process, and I came up upon it trying to fill the gable ends of the cordwood structure and didn't want to have logs above beams and so I thought about how to approach that. Also was uh, concerned about the look of logs in the wind brace sections of the, of the timber frame. So first I took the sawdust and mixed it with a clay slip, similar to how one would in a straw clay slip wall and formed it into place. Was not particularly thrilled with how the clay bonded with the sawdust and you know it was crumbly when you tried to plaster it so i recalled a technique that i'd seen um, used by left hand hemp company in a build we did of a hempcrete sauna in Lyons, colorado i've made another video where i'm talking about that story if you're interested in the, the full origin of this concept long story short Hempcrete is hemp herd, the center of the hemp stock, mixed with a lime that comes from the southern part of France, which has properties very similar to Portland cement. On that build, we ran out of that lime and used a recipe that was half lime, uh, just type S lime and Portland cement to finish off the rest of that build. So I thought, what if we tried that technique with the sawdust, which is particularly chunky from our local mill, and so mixed up a batch, formed it in another place on that uh, original part of the building, and it worked fantastic. So did the gable ends with that. There's quite a bit of it in there. And then for this addition, I wanted to do the whole thing with an 8x8 frame. And this is uh, actually not a timber frame in the sense that it is not relying on tension joinery for its stability. I'm using hardware in a lot of locations, uh, you know, beefy L brackets and that sort of thing, instead of the conventional uh, timber frame joinery. Used a few um, uh, beefy screws in some places, so a quicker uh, approach to getting the frame together. And then inside of the 8x8 void, so we've got an eight inch thick wall. I've got seven inches of this hempcrete. So it's mostly sawdust, which is extremely insulative and should be stable and insect and fire resistant due to the presence of the masonry binders, the Portland and the lime, extremely alkaline. So it shouldn't have any difficulty where it meets the wood and so in this video, I explain how I mix this, how I slip form it into place, how to handle the uh, frame structure of the wall so that uh, you can hang your forms off of it and go into some detail on how this sort of wall is produced. Uh, in a subsequent video, I will show how I plaster this. It just takes two coats of lime plaster on each side and you have a very high performing wall that costs approximately a dollar and 80 cents to finish, which is considerably less than what you would spend if you were to do a conventional wall.
this is the wall section. I will fill with dust crete today. So inside of the post and beam frame, I have built this light stud wall. So instead of being 16 inches on center, like a con conventionally framed wall, this is 24 on center. And these are rough sawn two by threes from the local mill. And you can see that I'm using these little sections of PEX plumbing tubing and spacers. There's a screw coming from the outside through that, attaching it to the frame. So then this will act as a cleat to keep the wall from wanting to tip. And it also allows me to hold the forms away from the frame so that they're completely encased in the dust crete. And that prevents thermal bridging through the different density of the wood and gives you a more energy efficient wall. So this light frame also gives us a scaffold upon which to mount our junction boxes and wiring, plumbing, things like that. We'll get uh, a couple of forms in here and mix up a batch of dust crete and start putting it in. I don't uh, need to be completely tight with all of these forms. If you've got a little ridge of dust crete that sticks out after you remove the form, it's easy enough to just knock it off to get back to flat. But I like to stay reasonably close and particularly doing this in the cold weather season, it pays to do a solid form on the outside of the wall and then I'll just use planks and work them up as I, as I fill this. That way I can heat the building on the inside and it will uh, keep all this dust creep warm enough to cure in a good way. And we'll get some forms on, mix a batch and press on. Tang these form boards. I'm just using a one by six uh, rough sawn from the mill. And so I take the screw on the top side and get about an inch of it proud and then put that against my stud. That sinks and establishes our depth. A minimum of uh, one and a half inches I think is good practice with this dust creep on the outside of a framing member like that. I don't use a spacer on the bottom edge. I just lean the board out and only sink the screw until it's flush with the frame. I like that. So I establish the depth with the top spacer and then I can see my reveal against the actual timber frame itself. And if the outside edge is flush there, when I drop the bottom one, I just sink it in enough to uh, make a nice plumb surface. So I'll go ahead and tack the rest of this in. We'll fill this first six inch void and then add a second board and then after that we just leapfrog them up and that's why we call this a slip form technique. sawdust is fairly chunky because it comes off that circular mill so the sawdust that would come off like a circular saw that you're using around the place uh, is probably a little fine for this so we want something with a little more chunk and body so it doesn't become a like particle board or MDF or something like that it's chunky enough to leave some airspace and that's what we're going to maximize our insulative capacity of this material but I can fill that truck like that for $20 just across the river so for this location this is an exceptional uh, natural building technique and appropriate to our climate as well so our recipe is the 15 gallons of sawdust 
To this we will add two gallons of Portland cement, two gallons of type S lime, and four gallons of water. still crumble about that consistency if it's shiny and obviously wet it won't hold a form it will sag and so we want it just wet enough to be able to do that like so So the important thing are the corners and edges. We've got this gap between the base plate of our subframe and our form. We want to make sure we get that really well packed. You can use a 2x4 to tamp or something like that. This stuff will stick to it and it's not even really all that necessary. If you get all your corners and edges well compacted then you can just kind of punch it down so it's nice and firm and that's all she takes so I'll finish the rest of this level put in another form work our way up making some good progress filling this wall so I will pull this bottom form and move it up you can see that I'm full in this upper form and the things that you need to be concerned about when you're filling these walls when you have things like junction boxes and I've got some bracing over uh, against the door jam there and so you want to make sure that things you can't pack from above before you put the next form up make sure you get them filled underneath then you can move your form up and pack around them so because all the screws are where the studs are they can stay in place you want to back the screws out pretty much all the way because when you're pulling the form that screw can catch and tear out a chunk of your uh, deskcrete. These uh, spacers that are in from the previous forms can be pulled out. You can wait till the next day and then just come back in and fill your holes with uh, more deskcrete or you can just leave them and fill them with plaster when you come through on your plastic coat. So when you pull this off, you want to pull it straight out towards you and not let it slide down the wall. And there you have that. Up it goes. Take my first spacer, slip it onto that screw. Like so, so you can see the bottom of this is loose. If I lean it out a little bit, and just drive that bottom screw until we're flush again, and we're off to the races. I stopped work yesterday right here and so before I go on to fill the rest of this void I'll take a sponge and moisten the top edge of the work that I completed yesterday to prevent the new work from drying too quickly and being pulled into that. Uh, what happens is you get a cold joint which will translate into a crack potentially in the future so on uh, this infill even if there is a visible line 
uh, it will be covered by the plaster. As long as we have structural integrity, that's the main thing. This is what I mean about filling the underside of things. I'm about to put a form on here, and so I can just fill the face there, but I've already got it packed in the back and up underneath. When we get to the top, I slide that form board up to just the distance from the top that this board is wide. And that allows me enough room to get the dustcrete in to the form and packed up on the outside of the subframe. And I just fill it out and run it a little bit fat. And then I'll take this board off and screw it on there to flatten everything down into the board. So there, I've just kind of made snowballs and stuffed them in there. And we'll take this form board and screw it against that and flatten it out. That wall is done. Ended up taking about six and a half hours in total. By comparison, this cordwood wall right here took three days, half the size. So certainly much more time efficient. This room is done. I've just stripped the forms on the outside of the gable end. So you can see what that looks like. So this, of course, we'll get a lime plaster because it's outside. And I left the frame exposed, recessed the dust creep behind it. There'll be another half inch or so of plaster that comes in there. But that's what we got.